In this video I'd like to discuss some mixed signal PCB and hardware design basics. Here you can see the Le DSP system on module, audio processing board with an STM32 H7 microcontroller, audio codec, SD card and some mezzanine connectors to interface with the daughter board. So let's go over the design of this board in this video. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, you can go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash fills lab and download a free Altium Designer trial. I will show you how I created a mixed signal PCB using Altium Designer in this video. Thank you also very much to JLC PCB where I had the system on module mixed signal PCBs produced and assembled. If you'd like to order these boards for yourself, you can go to my GitHub repository at github.com forward slash PMS67 and download the relevant files from the Le DSP repo. While we're talking about mixed signal hardware design, I recently released a mixed signal hardware design course with KiCad, which is a free eCAD software. In this course, you'll learn how to design a complete embedded mixed signal product from scratch. If you go to fills lab.net forward slash courses, you can read the entire course description. System requirements, part selection, how to read a data sheet and how we start with circuit design, schematic design, particular power supplies, schematic design where we look at digital sections such as microcontroller, USB, and so forth, schematic design of the analog and digital sections, so ADCs, DACs, and the analog front ends, some more schematic tips, footprint selection, footprint creation, as well as circuit simulation with LT Spice. And then we move over to PCB design where we set up the design rules. We do the whole layout in real time and of course the routing. We end the course with some finishing touches and then actually trying to get this product manufactured. If you'd like to purchase this course, it is released via fedevel.education and fills labshopfedevelleducation will take you there. And I'll leave links in the description, of course. So here I now am in Altium looking at the 3D view of the Le DSP system on module mixed signal board. In essence, this is an audio processing system. We have a microcontroller, a pretty strong one, STM32H7, running at about half a gigahertz with floating point units and so forth, processing data from an analog audio codec, so ADCs and DACs in one chip, and we can perform signal processing, add reverbs, delays, distortion, and whatever you can think of. We also have storage in the form of an SD card, various regulators, a serial wire debug header, and that's about it. The way we then can interface with this board is on the back side where we have these mezzanine or board to board connectors. The nice thing about making these system on modules is that you only have to design this main board once. So all the difficult mixed signal circuitry, you only have to design on this board and you can get, I don't know, hundreds of these produced and then you can design different carrier boards for different applications. So you can make a carrier board for guitar, for vocals, for God knows what, and simply reuse this board with these mezzanine connectors. So all the USB interfaces, digital I.O. and analog inputs and outputs are exposed via these mezzanine connectors. And here I've designed a, an example breakout board that breaks out all of these connections from the main system or module. So the system module will plug in here with the opposite gender mezzanine connectors. I've created all the analog circuitry, so the mic input, line inputs and outputs, headphone outputs, power inputs and regulation, and various control signals that go to the digital side. So already you can see both on the system module and also the carrier board, how nicely it's split up. And this is the most important thing in mixed signal design is keeping space and keeping proper separation between analog and digital. So I have all of my analog signals and side on the left here and on the right, pretty much symmetrical, I have all my digital parts. In this way, all this digital circuitry will hardly interfere with the analog circuitry over here. Going back to the system on module, the similar ideas are here as well. Close to the left, I have my analog side, my codec, which is split essentially analog on this side, digital on this side, and all the digital section on this side. I also have different analog and digital regulators. So here I have an analog regulator and a digital regulator here to minimize cross feeding between digital and analog noise. And of course, the same thing we have then on the bottom side, we have an analog mezzanine connector and a digital mezzanine connector. And of course, mounting holes to then firmly secure it to whatever daughter board we're connecting this to. These hints and the hints and tips we'll be going through throughout the schematic, you can find in the mixed signal hardware design course I showed you at the beginning. In this case, it'll then be done in KiCad, but in far greater detail than in this video. So let's go through the schematic bit by bit. Again, the mixed signal hardware design course goes in far greater detail how to design these boards, 
all the way from requirements capture to part selection. In essence, what you typically want with a mixed signal design is split power supplies. So you might have several rails. In this case, we only have two different rails, one for the digital side, which is 3.3 volts, and one for the analog, which is at 1.8 volts. Now 3.3 and 1.8 is specified or required by the ICs you choose. So my microcontroller requires 3.3 and my analog codec requires 3.3 for the digital side, but also 1.8 volts analog for the analog side. All of the surrounding circuitry you can find from the data sheets. So what input and output capacitors you need, what bypass capacitors you need and so forth. You can see on the analog side, I'm also performing some additional filtering by a ferrite bead and this sort of Pi network with these two capacitors. You can see here also do not place capacitors or do not place parts and zero ohm parts are very important. So do not place means it won't be populated during assembly, but if you have, for example, too much noise on this regulator, then you can maybe include this capacitor or fit one retroactively to try and reduce the noise. Remember to name all of your nets. So I've named every single nets with that power or even these maybe slightly insignificant nets over here. This will become incredibly important with layout and routing. Also make sure you annotate your schematics with titles, section them off, and also the title block down here. Tell people who you are, who designed this, what revision it is, and so on. Next, we have the microcontroller section and peripherals, which is a bit more involved. We are choosing an STM32H7 microcontroller because of its power and processing capabilities. It also has quite a lot of decoupling, an SD card connector, as well as a serial wire debug header. And this is a Tag Connect solderless header. Let's just go briefly through this one by one. Again, the SCM32H7 is great for digital signal processing because it has so much raw power, running at almost half gigahertz, having dual precision floating point units and so forth. The choice is quite obvious if you want to implement fairly complex audio processing algorithms. The pinout, as noted down here, was done via STM32 Cube IDE, which is the free software provided by ST. So the pinout where I squared C is, where the USB pins are and the SD card pins are is done via that software and you can see that in my previous videos. Important points are pull up resistors for the I squared C lines and for 3.3 volts, 2.2 kilo ohms is pretty much fine, also for high speed. USB in Altium, if we have differential pairs, we need to denote that by underscore N and underscore P and also by this flag, which is the differential pair directive. Status or indicator LEDs are always important to design, no matter if it's debugging or later stages of your product. Current limiting resistors, I choose typically about a kilo ohm for 3.3 volts, and that gives me a milliamp or just a bit less than that. And that's perfectly fine for debug S and D LEDs. Remember to annotate your intentions on the schematic. So I might want to have one of these USBs for data streaming and the other one for programming, for example. A big part also is timing. And for accurate timing, we require an external crystal oscillator. I've chosen a 24 megahertz crystal oscillator and the load capacitor calculations I've denoted up here. This particular crystal oscillator has a specified load capacitance of nine picofarads. I'm estimating my board capacitance to be about four picofarads. And using my formula of two times the load capacitance minus the stray capacitance gives me an approximate ballpark value of what these load capacitors need to be. And these need to be equal. You can also see here I have my feed resistor, which is just, you know, a couple of tens of ohms. And this makes sure I do not overdrive my crystal. It also helps limit harmonics by filtering and also by not overdriving the crystal. Of course, if you wish to program this device, this microcontroller, we can either do that via USB, but my preferred way is via serial wide debug because I can set breakpoints, monitor variables, and so forth. I'm using a Tag Connect solderless header, which I'll show you in just a second, which means I don't actually have to solder on a component and can use pogo pin probes to do so. I'm adding ESD protection, and again, more detail is given in the Mixed Signal Hardware Design course, and also these current limiting resistors. So in case I short one of these pins when I'm probing it wrong to ground, and there's currently a high voltage on this, I don't get too great maximum short circuit current. Also, a 100 nanofarad capacitor on reset prevents spurious resets. And again, annotating that on the schematic helps you and others in the future. Of course, our microcontroller and our digital ICs, even analog ones, will require some form of decoupling. So I have 100 nanofarad capacitors per VDD or VBAT pin, and also this bulk decoupling capacitor over here. 2.2 microfarads up to 10 microfarads, somewhere close to the IC is more than fine. For the analog section of this microcontroller, so this, the power supply that would feed the ADCs and DACs is given by this VDDA pin and VREF plus pin. Again, decoupling capacitors plus some form of filtering. 
on the right, and this is specific to this particular IC and package, are these VCAP pins, and these are bypass capacitor connections for internal regulators to the STM32 microcontroller. ST from the data sheets and application manuals say that the VCAP pins need to be connected to low equivalent series resistance or ESR capacitors. So make sure to denote that on the schematic. Here we have the SD card connector. And keep in mind, the SM32 also has internal ESD protection. Sometimes it's better to just rely on the internal ESD protection as we are doing here. But of course, you could add ESD protection close to the connector of this SD card. We have some filtering for the SD power supply and a little bit of ESD protection for the rail and some pull-up resistors, which are most likely required by the SD MMC interface or the SDIO interface. You can see this series resistor here for the clock, and this is to help with EMI problems and signal integrity problems to prevent ringing. And this is a resistor you might have to play around with in value. Something close to zero ohms or a couple of tens of ohms is usually okay. We also have this card detect signal on this particular SD connector. By looking at data sheets, you can see that SD cards actually have an internal card detect pull-up resistor, which is about 50 kilo ohms. And to prevent this pin from floating, I can use a large value pull-down resistor in case no card is inserted to tell the SM32 microcontroller that no card is inserted. Moving on to the codec section, codec means coder and decoder. So we have the ADCs and DACs, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. And this schematic I have pretty much taken directly from the data sheet. As I said before, this is a system on module which plugs into a daughter board. So all of the relevant external analog circuitry, for example, op-amp filters, anti-aliasing filters, and so forth, will be on the daughter board. In the design in the mixed signal hardware course, I actually do everything in one and show you how to design the analog front ends. Here I've done it a bit simpler and left that to the daughter board designer. We have our digital and analog supply rails, of course, with the required decoupling, labeling my nets. Serial audio interface or I squared S connection to the microcontroller, which is similar or very similar to SBI, and that streams my ADC and DAC data. As you can see, I can have a microphone input, stereo line input, headphone output, and of course my stereo line output. Of course, we need to interface with the outside world or rather with our daughter board, and for that, we have two mezzanine connectors. Now, of course, we could use one, but it's good to have our analog and digital separation. So I have one digital mezzanine connector and one analog mezzanine connector connected to my STM32 microcontroller, as well as to my codec outputs and inputs. The mezzanine connectors also serve as a power input. So this is where I get my plus 5 volt rail from. I perform some filtering and ESD protection on that specific. And what you can see as well is that I'm using quite a lot of ground pins, and this is recommended. So for every signal pin, be that digital or analog, it is necessary or required for signal integrity and EMI to provide a proper return path. And you can do that by placing a ground pin adjacent to every signal pin. And I prefer to do even more. So you can see I'm surrounding or shielding in a way every single signal pin, be that analog or be that digital. With differential pairs, you can see they are next to each other because typically the return currents with differential pairs are within each other. But of course, you should place adequate ground around them as well. And that, in essence, brings us to the end of the schematic. So fairly simple, not too involved. Let's move over and have a look at how the PCB is constructed. The golden rule of mixed signal hardware design is space and separation. Now, for something of this size, which is fairly small, of course, it's difficult to maintain proper or the greatest separation you can. You can see the digital side is somewhere over here, and the analog side is restricted to this end. I've tried to keep a bit of space and route signals that are analog and sensitive away from the digital components, but of course there's a limit to this kind of size. We have the microcontroller, it's called kind of the centerpiece with the status LEDs, SD card pretty close, and that's also a thing you should remember is keep your trace distance or length as short as possible. This is the serial wire debug header I talked about before. This enables me to just plug in a special probe rather than a typical connector. That means I save board space and board cost because this is rather small. My codec is over here, and then my connectors are on the other side of the board. What you can see, or the golden rules, also are to keep space between traces. So if I can, as soon as I break out, for example, from these QFN ICs, I go out and I keep maximum distance or as far as I can between these traces. Also, decoupling capacitors should be as close as possible or as realistic to the ICs. So this is good. I don't want to place it any closer because I might have problems with assembly and soldering and debugging. So decoupling capacitors close with short white traces. You can also see for this QFN package where typically the pads are underneath, I've brought out these pads a bit so I can probe them with a very fine tip and this helps me with debugging. 
Another thing on decoupling capacitors, every time I have groups of ground, for example here, or groups of the same net, I will use what is called power puddles with several vias going to ground, and this helps with my inductance. Same thing over here with the SM32 microcontroller. Decoupling capacitors are important and should be placed as close as possible to the relevant IC pins, again using power puddles all around. Pull up, pull down resistors and so forth, you can place further away. If we look at the 2D view, you can see as soon as I get out of pins, I try to branch away and give myself proper separation between signal lines and not routing them as close as I can together, because that'll help with my crosstalk and minimize noise. So not only between analog and digital sections we have to pay attention, but also in analog sections themselves and within digital sections themselves. My stack up is signal, ground, ground, signal, and in the mixed signal hardware design course, I'll tell you more about why I'm doing that. In essence, it's for proper ground and return currents and EMI. You can also see next to signal vias when I'm switching from the top to the bottom lane or the other way around, because I have two ground planes internally, I'm also playing this ground return current via close to my signal pins. This really helps with my return currents. Here we have a typical power section. So for example, this LDO regulator, and I'm using large copper poles, ground fills, or power puddles, as I like to call them, to link these up. And I'm routing my power because I have internal ground planes, not power planes, by these thick wide traces. And you'll find that about half a millimeter is pretty good for carrying currents even up to about two or three amps without a significant temperature rise. So that's how I typically route my four layer boards. Signal, ground, ground, signal with routed power. Looking at the other side of the board, I have my mezzanine connectors left and right, so my analog and digital. Again, trying to keep good spacing between the digital and analog sections. And you can see all of these ground return pins on my mezzanine connectors to help signal integrity and EMI. Once you're done with layout and routing and you've maintained proper separation between traces and components, analog and digital sides, of course you have to add silkscreen. That includes indicating component orientations, name of the board, maybe your logo, indicating what these LEDs mean. For example, we want an on status LED or this status LED of the microcontroller. Maybe when the board was designed, mounting holes, of course ground planes, design rule checks, and making sure your PCB is production ready, something you'll learn in the mixed signal course as well. So once you have these boards produced, you can then design the circuitry for the breakout board or the daughter board. As shown before, this is pretty generic and breaks out everything from these mezzanine connectors. The nice thing about our system on module is that I can, for this daughter board, use a far simpler design. This is only a two layer board, ground on the bottom, signal on the top. In this way, I can save cost because I can get very many of these system on modules produced and then just click them in, don't have to redesign them for whatever carrier board I'm making. Again, separation is important between analog and digital, adding silk screen and indicating what each of these parts do. Make sure also to have proper 3D models for your footprints and for your components. And because this will help you really with your CAD, your MCAD design, so mechanical design, to make sure, for example, this daughter board will fit some sort of enclosure. So I hope you enjoyed this brief overview of mixed signal hardware design, this time in Altium. If you'd like to learn in far greater detail about mixed signal hardware design, good rules of thumb and guidance, check out the mixed signal hardware design course with KeyCAD, so free eCAD software. You can get the courses at Fedevel Education, and I'll of course leave links in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.